Hello and welcome to this very special conversation. Uh, my name is Barry Shepherd. I am a PhD researcher and historian in Queen's University Belfast. I host a TV show in Belfast called History Now, but my area of research is the uh, rural Irish organisation Winchinatira, the People of the Land, founded in 1931 by Father John Hayes, later Canon John Hayes. And Tomorrow, as we're recording this, tomorrow is the 90th anniversary of the founding of the organization. And I'm really delighted that I'm getting the opportunity to speak to Mr. Martin Quinn, who's a community activist and former president of Munchen Atira. He's also an author, has a book out recently, and perhaps we'll just get a, a mention of that later on in the conversation. But today we're just going to talk about Canon Hayes, the foundation of Munchen Atira, and what it meant to rural Irish society. So Martin, you're very welcome and I'm delighted to get the chance to speak with you today. Thanks very much Barry. I'm delighted to be involved in this uh, historic, I suppose, commemoration of Munchen Atira because uh, my own involvement as a former national president uh, brought me into uh, an area that I previously didn't know an awful lot about, you know, and uh, I knew of Canon Hayes and I knew of some of the various projects, but I, I got to find out an awful lot about the history of the organization and indeed the history of the man. Yeah, so you're, you know, almost learning on the job, learning the history on the job. Uh, well, my background uh, comes from looking at organizations that developed in the 1930s against the backdrop of the depression. And I found some, you know, English organizations who were founded on the basis of Catholic social teaching of the period. And that was my inroads into mentioning it here. But what I didn't know was in the 1940s, my father's side of the family who were from Clock Jordan and County Tipperary were involved in mentioning it here. So I thought there's a personal thing here for me as well to, you know, uncover and unearth. And it's just snowballed from there. And what I'm doing with my research is looking at the the many international connections the organization made, especially in the period uh, John Hayes was in charge. But I suppose to begin with, you like anyone, your formative years perhaps shaped the destination of your life. And this was certainly the case with John Hayes, born on the 11th of November, 1887, St. Martin's uh, Day, and born into a country in turmoil, a rural a society in turmoil with the Land League. He was actually born in exile in a Land League hut. Can you tell us a bit about that and you know what your understanding is of it? Yes, well, Father Hayes, as you mentioned, was born in a Land League hut, um, quite near to the Hayes family farm. You know, they were evicted from the farm. And uh, John Hayes, as you say, was born in a time of great turmoil in Ireland. And I think that um, one of the things that he spoke about at every opportunity was that he was born in a Land League hut. He wanted to put that forward at every available opportunity. Indeed, some of the times his audience wouldn't have realized the significance of the Land League and uh, the fact that he was born in a hut. And, uh, but still, he never wasted the opportunity to tell people that uh, he was born in a Land Lake hut. And uh, he was nurtured, I suppose, on the tales of times in that particular period. And the evictions and the nailing up of doors and the quenching of the fires in the hearth and all of that. And uh, growing up then in, in, uh, in a hut where I suppose the significance of it could never be underestimated because it had a huge significance on his life, on his health, and on the health of uh, other members of the family that were born there because they, they, anyone that was born there suffered from rickets and uh, he suffered from that as well. And uh, the time was a very difficult time in Ireland and uh, I think that you know, he, he, he knew so much about it as a child growing up and all the tales of it that it never lost, uh, lost significance with him. And it was something that remained with him 
right throughout his life. Yeah, and of course, one of the central figures of that period was a, a man Hayes very much admired, and that was Michael David. And interestingly, you say there that Hayes, at every opportunity, would speak about his family's eviction and being born in a land leak hut. There's a lot more written about Michael David than John Hayes, of course. And a lot of people who have written about Michael David comment on how that eviction during the famine of the David family in Mayo drove Michael David in his future endeavours. And he kept referring back to that eviction. So Hayes, in many ways, parallel what David was doing? Yes, indeed. And uh, I think that there was huge significance in the fact uh, that, you know, the Hayes family, where they were evicted from, and uh, the land was owned by Lord Tran Curry. And uh, there was major disputes, of course, in relation to people being evicted from that land. And uh, the, the, the whole movement, I think, that the Land League movement was uh, something that resonated uh, very strongly with uh, John Hayes as he moved former, forward in his formative years. And uh, the fact that, you know, the, the Devitt's Land League roused the masses as they had, had hardly ever been roused before and uh, this also led, of course, to uh, the founding of the Property Defense Association. You know, so there was uh, the, the, the Land Act, which was introduced, which Gladstone introduced in 1881, had the effect, uh, had a good effect there because uh, it, the new reform was good and it was uh, far reaching. And um, perhaps I suppose its most beneficial clause was that tenants were to be allowed to take cases to a land court. Mm -hmm. And all of this, I suppose, would have uh, had huge significance on John Hayes growing up. Yeah, and as you say, that, that, that Land Act, Gladstone's Land Act, the Hayes family, among others, you know, weren't necessarily beneficiaries of that because they were you know, that dispute with Lord Cloncurry lasted for a long time. They were in the Langley Cut, the family, for 13 years. They only got back in, you know, 12 years, maybe 1894, I think they got back in. So it was a long time. It was very protected. People think that, you know, in some cases, this was settled after maybe a few months or a year or two years. It was a very long period for the Hayes family. It was indeed. Uh, I mean, what started out, I think, uh, thinking that this would only be a couple of months, went on, as you say, for approximately 12 and a half years. And uh, what is very significant, I suppose, as well in that period for the Hayes family was that seven funerals left that hut in the 12 and a half years. You know, so, uh, I mean, the Hayes family were surrounded by, by funerals during that particular period. And I mean, with, with infants and with children, as well as with older members mm. of the family. So uh, all of that would have had a huge significance on John Hayes and on his thinking and of uh, hearing about the, the funerals coming out of the Lend Lake hut. Yeah, and it's a, you know, it's a, I think it's impossible to, you know, exaggerate you know, the, the impact this had upon him, but it also had an impact upon his brother, Mick. The two of them, I think, and Stephen Wren in his 1960 biography of John Hayes shows how, you know, advanced nationalism and republicanism crept in. Of course, Mick went on to play a role in the War of Independence and the hunger strikes of 1920. But John was probably diverted from that path by achieving a scholarship to the Irish College in Paris in 1907. It was pretty much a life-changing experience for him, wasn't it? It was indeed, I suppose. Um, that was the most significant uh, thing really that happened in John Hayes's life. Uh, I think that that scholarship uh, was hugely, hugely significant. You couldn't uh, overestimate, I think, the significance of it because, I mean, it changed his thinking 
um, it also uh, allowed him to experience uh, other situations in other countries, you know, and it allowed him a greater understanding, I suppose, of what was happening across the world. And uh, this was uh, a major thing for him, uh, his education in Paris. And uh, um, I, I think that, you know, um, had he, you know, just followed the route of being uh, uh, studying here at home uh, in Ireland, uh, I think maybe John Hayes's life would have been very different. And uh, uh, that's why I think that, he, you know, his studying in Paris was, as, uh, as I said, hugely significant. Yeah, and, and the time that he arrives in Paris in 1907 is hugely significant in terms of French Catholic history. Two years previously, you have the act of separation, you know, for, uh, the, the, under the, the, I think it's the Third Republic, the separate church and state, and this caused a backlash against young clerical students like John Hayes was, and there were lots of fights between local boys and, you know, the, Irish, the, the, the students in the Irish College in Paris. But what is really interesting as well is this causes an, an almost a kind of backlash as well in another way. Uh, social Catholicism in France takes an upturn, and I think John Hayes witnessed a lot of that, whether it be in the rural French countryside or in Paris with the beatification of Joan of Arc. And I know Stephen Wren talks about that. So there's a lot of things going on outside of his studies that impact upon his thinking. And I think that, you know, European French social Catholicism really has an imp uh, makes a strong impression on him going forward. Yes, I, I think so. Um, you know, in relation to him, uh, studying in Paris, I suppose the only city that he had seen uh, prior to that was the home city of Limerick, you know, so uh, this was uh, a huge change for John Hayes. And as you said, the beatification of St. Joan of Arc was a highlight of his time in Paris. And uh, he mentioned that quite frequently. Um, you know, the French uh, went, went wild, I suppose, uh, with joy at that time. And uh, for John Hayes, it was also a very significant occasion. And many of the students at the Irish College disliked Paris, you know, and they disliked the people too. Whereas uh, John Hayes had a strong feeling for, for Paris and for the old historical and religious bonds that existed between France and Ireland. You know, so that was of huge significance to him as well. And as you say, he saw, um, he saw another side, I suppose, to the world uh, in Paris. And uh, it was something, um, I, I, I'm trying to think of the proper word, but it was like a sponge, I suppose, if you like, for him, because he was able to absorb all that was happening. And uh, whereas other people maybe uh, weren't so keen on, on what was going on around them. Uh, he took a keen interest. Yeah. And uh, Mark Tierney, who, who wrote the, the book, uh, The First 70 Years of Munchenateer, which was published in 2004, he talks about that experience, like you say, like a sponge. He's soaking up all these different ideas. And Tierney says that by the time Hayes was ordained in 1913, he had become a Francophile and a European, which is very significant. Uh, he learns, becomes fluent, fluent in French, but not only visits the rural French countryside, he goes across to Belgium and there, and he's picking up ideas there. And what Rin talks about is very interesting, that he comes back from all these, you know, adventures, really enthused and gives talks on them in, in the, the, the French, uh, the, the Irish College in Paris. So... But there's something I want to pick up on there, and it's very interesting that you said he looks at the, the long view, the historic view. And I think when you find that whatever period of John Hayes's life is there, he's always referring back to history. So he was very uh, passionate about history, I think. Yeah, I think that everything in John Hayes's life came back to his experience in the Langley Court. 
mm. you know, and uh, that that had uh, had a huge effect on him. But it also allowed him, as we'll say, as you said, uh, when he was in Paris and going over to Belgium, it allowed him to um, be able to take a different view. And um, when I look back on John Hayes's life, I'm amazed really at his thinking and his European dimension and how this influenced him in what he was later to do in rural Ireland. And I think that there hasn't been enough um, credit, if you like, given to uh, what, he, what he thought about and uh, what he enabled to do uh, when he came home to Ireland and uh, setting up of Winton Atira and his involvement in community development and he's reaching out to other people. And I think that's one of the key things that, that I have great admiration for John Hayes is the fact that he wasn't closed off in his thinking. In fact, quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. He was really open to what other people were doing, what they were saying and what they were thinking about. And uh, this is something I think that, you know, we should celebrate uh, at every opportunity. And it's great to have this opportunity to talk about Muinton Atira and about the life of John Hayes, because uh, these opportunities don't come around too often. Yeah. So as you say there, the, probably the only city he'd really experience of was Limerick before he goes to Paris. Paris is you know, hugely cosmopolitan and he's getting into all these different European influences. He comes back in, 1915, 1913, sorry, and he has a couple of temporary appointments in, in small rural parishes, one in, in County Meath. Must have been an awful culture shock coming back to, from Paris, the, you know, small, um, you know, a, a small territory like that. But it, it isn't that long before he's moved off to Liverpool. And as you said to me in, in communications before, that was another of these hugely um, influential periods of his life. Yeah, I think the uh, Liverpool one was, um, and I wouldn't have known an awful lot about it uh, when I joined Winter Matera. Um, but I think that, you know, having spoken to people like uh, Tom Fitzgerald and others in Winter, and having learned an awful lot about Canon Hayes, I realise how hugely significant in time his time in Liverpool was. Not alone because of the fact, you know, that uh, he's a brother there in, in uh, jail, uh, in Wormwood Scrubs. And um, the fact that uh, not alone that and the, and the whole significance around that particular time, but also what he saw and witnessed uh, in uh, Liverpool, in the slums there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that, you know, he's thinking later in, in Ireland, um, he would often refer back to uh, his time in Liverpool and the difficulties that he saw and that he witnessed. And, uh, you know, particularly for the Irish in Liverpool mm -hmm. at that time. And uh, the whole event, I think, in, in Warrenwood Scrubs is, uh, is amazing, really. You know, it is an amazing story, the fact that he persevered and that he brought people around him. Um, ultimately, his objective was, I suppose, to get visiting rights, you know, there uh, for uh, his brother in Warrenwood Scrubs, uh, but also for other Irish that were there. Mm -hmm. And that particular time, reaching out to other people, to orange men and to people of all denominations. And um, I think that uh, the, one, of the, one of the things that was reported in the, in, the, in the Daily Mail at the time around the attack, the attacks that they suffered, you know, when um, one of his things would be, of course, to bring people around to say the rosary and everything. But of course, he had another objective to it. 
and uh, the fact that he was able to bring people along with him and uh, to have such a significant influence at that time says an awful lot about the man. Yeah, and you've made a very good point there that he interacted with Orange men and Protestants at attached to Ireland and, and the north of Ireland. That's, you know, stretching across those sectarian lines because the sectarianism in Liverpool at that period was really bad. And I think it was made worse by what was going on in Ireland. And I think for context, we need to say that John Hayes was in Liverpool for eight and a half to nine years, which covers the bulk of, you know, what we now call the Irish Revolutionary Period. So, did, you know, um, relations between, you know, Protestants and Catholics in Liverpool were never great at that point, but I think they were made worse by what was going on in Ireland at the time. And he did reach out to them and the Liverpool Echo, I think it was, uh, significantly they talked about that as John Hayes was leaving to return to Ireland. But his non-sectarianism is a, is a massive part of the identity of Munchenatira when he comes back to Ireland. And I think that sets it apart from a lot of the organisations that, you know, came uh, up in the 1920s and 30s. Would, would you agree with that? Yes, uh, I think so. Um, just going back uh, for a second to the uh, whole episode in Wormwood Scrubs where, uh, you know, where there was an attack uh, on those that were saying the rosary and mm -hmm. demonstrating and looking for, for visiting rites. Um, I think that one of the, uh, I, I suppose you could say it's funny, but it wasn't funny, uh, but it was amusing, I suppose, was the fact that, you know, the volunteers there that were in, in prison, the Irish volunteers on the orders of the Viceroy, uh, Lord French and yes Lord French's sister uh, was out campaigning with uh, John Hayes yeah. and his team wearing a steel helmet he reports uh, he reported later wearing a steel helmet so that she wouldn't get stones uh, rained down on top of her and it was amazing to report to hear that account that uh, he was able to bring somebody like that along yeah. with him. Charlotte uh, Despard. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I think that, you know, that whole episode um, was hugely significant because, as we say, it was at uh, a time where Ireland was, uh, uh, there, was there was great war in the country and uh, the those that the volunteers then that were in jail in uh, England were being denied their rights and uh, Canon Hayes was to the forefront in uh, looking for the rights for those people and it, it didn't make any difference to him who he spoke to mm -hmm. you know he used every opportunity to speak to people and whether it was an orange man whether it was uh, an orange MP, um, he, he, he made it to, us to go and meet them because he felt, uh, I think, as he said to one of them, you know, are you just representing a section of the people or are you representing everybody? Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I think that um, the fact that he could do something like that, I think, was hugely significant. But uh, I think that when he came back to, uh, to Ireland, I think all of that um, and all of the effect of it, as you say, he was there for a considerable number of years. So the effect of that uh, will have had played a, a huge part in his thinking um, about where Ireland was going to go in the future. Yeah. And b before I talk about that, because in the 1940s, he comes up to Northern Ireland, he comes up to Belfast, he addresses people in St Mary's Hall on the Falls Road, he also comes to Queen's University and meets people of all different religious backgrounds and political persuasions and tries to seek out common cause with a lot of them. And in 1942, some of them come down to Rural Week, which is a big, you know, was a big part of, of Richard Matera. But 
we'll maybe talk about that later. But I think what needs to be said is that like France, like Paris, where he's drawn in all these different continental inspirations, he was doing similar in Liverpool, as you say, he's there for eight and a half years. He starts up some social study groups which talk about Chesterton's distributism. And I know some people have compared what he did with Munchen it here to this distributism, which is, you know, um, small ownership, small land ownership, very rural focused. Uh, these study groups that he was um, establishing all took place under the watch of his superior in Liverpool, and that was Archbishop uh, Frederick Keating. And Keating was nothing happened under his watch, you know, that he didn't know about. So I think he was doing all these things with the blessing of Keating. And Keating was a, a known distributist and friend with G.K. Chesterton and people like that who were the, you know, the theorists behind all these uh, movements. So I think there's a lot of influence Hayes is drawing in there and brings back to Ireland as well when he comes back in 1924. I mean, he, he definitely sought to influence, I suppose, the, the hierarchy as best he could and to bring them on his side, if you like, of what he was thinking and uh, to get them thinking, I suppose, the same way. Now, not everyone, of course, agreed with John Hayes, um, as you can well imagine. You know, not everybody in the church agreed with him and some would um, remonstrate with him and maybe try and put him down as, uh, as much as possible. But of course, he always had a quip back at people. Uh, he was very humorous and uh, uh, very quick, I suppose, to to respond to people, you know, when they said something about him. And uh, I recall reading that um, you mentioned one of the occasions about him going up to the north and he meeting people of different denominations and religions. And uh, when he came back, one particular bishop said to him, um, what was he doing, more or less? What was he doing going up there and mixing with those kind of people? Um, and that was kind of the term that he said to, mm. to John Hayes. And John Hayes responded by saying, those kind of people don't have horns on their heads. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, he said, uh, I was there with them uh, to hear their views and to respond to them. And he, um, I suppose, and this was something in later life in Bansha as well that he brought with him. But he brought, I think, uh, something which was very unusual at the time for a Catholic priest. Uh, he brought with him the view that everybody was equal. You know, he, he didn't see any difference in somebody of one religion or another. And I think that was amazing, really, for a man at that time. And uh, it was something that he brought with him uh, to different places, but particularly to Bansha, where Canon Hazelton and himself became really, really good friends. And it was all about reaching across to people and uh, extending the hand of friendship. And that was something that he, he did right throughout his life. Yeah. And w when he comes back to Ireland in uh, 1924, 1925, there's a lot of division going along. You know, you're after a, a sustained period of political violence and political upheaval. You've got the scars of civil war. You've got the Great Depression. You know, you've got a, a huge economic downturn. All these factors, you know, I think brought him to establish Munchenateer Limited, which was the first incarnation of Munchenateer. And that, you know, occurred in 1931. As we say, tomorrow, as we're recording, this is the 90th anniversary of it. Can you tell us a bit about your understanding of the, the first incarnation of Munchenateer? Yes, well, of course, he was, uh, he, he was in Castellani, mm -hmm. 
mm. a lot more Castellani. And uh, I suppose at that particular time, he, he dabbled in rural industries. You know, that, um, that was his thinking. And that was one of his first things was, you know, rural industries and how about how he could go about getting people um, to work as well as the land, if you like, and to benefit from working the land. And um, in doing that, you know, he, he, he came, I suppose, he was bringing a lot of uh, his thinking from his time uh, with in the in the family farm in in Moher, and um, hearing, I suppose, that different things that were being announced through the county committees of agriculture. You know, I think that you know, the giving away of the giving of free rhubarb and things like that um, to suitable applicants, and this all um, put him up to thinking that uh, rural industries was the way to go. So, uh, you know, in, 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 uh, in, I suppose, his time in Castellani, um, you know, a lot of people think of um, Winton Atira and uh, it being founded in Tipperary. Uh, but it was the original time in Castellini, I think, when he was in Castellini, when um, Winter Natira uh, was, uh, he was uh, a seed, if mm -hmm. you like. Yeah. And that was, you know, the Castellani people were uh, very strong, I think, in always identifying the fact that uh, the, the thinking behind mm -hmm. Winter Natira and the, the people of the land and what it stood for formulated when he was in Castellani. And that's quite true because he brought people around him at that time, um, even including the, the Castellani farmers, you know, who, um, who were, I suppose, looking for better prices for their produce, you know, the likes of potatoes and everything. And uh, he was to the forefront of all of that. So that's where I think the whole origins of Muinton Atira came from, is that kind of uh, dabbling, I suppose, in, in rural industry in Castellani. Yeah, and I, I suppose, you know, on, on these comparisons, it's not just me making these comparisons, in Munchen Atira publications like Rural Ireland and the landmark in the 1940s, people made the connection between that and Plunkett's cooperative, rural cooperative movement. I think that maybe it was too close to that model in the beginning. And I know Rin talks about the influence Plunkett had upon his thinking in that regard. But it's it's that Munchen Atira Limited was was almost it was slow to take off. And in those first few years, that's when he introduces the rural weekends, which were based on the, the French movement, the Semaine Sociale. But can we talk about, after a couple of years of Munchen Atira Limited, he gets this opportunity to go to Argentina for the 1934 Eucharistic Congress. And I think this is one of these other life-changing um, experiences that he has, uh, you know, as, as well as Paris and Liverpool. Yes, uh, just uh, with reference, I suppose, to his time in Castellani, you know, as you say, Winter Tier, it was slow to take off, but nevertheless, there was a stream of visitors to mm -hmm. him, to the presbytery in, in Castellani, and coming from all different parts, you know, from Liverpool and from Dublin and from different parts of the county and from Limerick. And... Um, this was where he would have thought, I suppose, um, about how he could get the whole idea of uh, people working together for the benefit of communities and uh, how he could make 
rural Ireland a stronger place for people to live and to work in. And, you know, this is where I suppose as well that he met somebody who was very significant in his life in Eamon de Valera. You know, this is mm -hmm. his first encounters there with Eamon de Valera too. And, um, you know, after de Valera's party came into power, um, Dr. James Ryan was Minister for Agriculture and uh, he was a regular caller uh, to John Hayes at that time. And that's where they built up a whole rapport, I think, yeah. around uh, the significance of rural industry and doing things for rural Ireland. And uh, uh, you mentioned about the rural weekends. You know, the first was in Ross Gray uh, in 1933, mm -hmm. uh, in November of November, 1933. Yeah. And that was a hugely significant event. You know, the, the rural weekends were um, a major thing. There were a major opportunity, I suppose, for people to come together and to discuss progress and to discuss uh, aspects of life and suggestions and all of that kind of thing. But it was also an opportunity for people to do a bit of cordiquing, I suppose, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, to, um, to chat and talk and play a game of cards and do other things as well. There's a whole social element to the uh, rural weekends yeah. that was very significant. Yeah, and that that's uh, on, on that topic, Martin, I think Stephen Wren mentions it in his book, but Father Edward uh, Coyne, Edward J. Coyne, he's at the first rural weekend. Mm -hmm. And I think he mentions it too in his report on it, that you know, you have people who would have been Fianna Fáil supporters at this time, but also people who would have been attached to the blue shirts are meeting at these rural weekends and, you know, maybe not discussing politics, but, you know, discussing society. So you've got people from, you know, really diametrically opposed political viewpoints in these rooms talking to one another, which I think is hugely significant. Yes, uh, indeed. And, and it goes back, I suppose, to the whole thing of him um, at different stages of his life in reaching out to others and in trying to bring others together. Um, a lot of it may be um, trying to get people around to his way of thinking, but as well uh, to learn about what was happening in other people's lives and in other people's places of, of employment and uh, of farming areas and uh, the rural weekends were hugely significant in that because as you say, you know, the, the, the first one would have been attended by the Minister for Agriculture, uh, Dr. Ryan, that I mentioned there earlier, and um, uh, with, along with senior officers from the department, but it would also, uh, as you say, be, be attended by many others uh, of other political persuasions and uh, I think that that was the whole thing of the, the, the nature of the event in having the, the, the cup of tea and the game of cards and the chat and the talk uh, was all um, hugely important to the weekend. And this was where people learned more than they did, I suppose, at the lectures and, and at what uh, the, the the various things that were being delivered, yeah. uh, the papers that were being delivered. It was uh, outside of that where people learned about each other and where yeah. they learned to realise what other people, what was happening in other people's lives. Yeah, and that, as that developed into the, the later 1930s and the 1940s, right up to, you know, the 1960s, it expanded into a week-long format and became, became more international. But before we can talk about that, could we just briefly mention his 1934 trip to Argentina at the Eucharist of Congress? Because he was in the Argentine for almost six months, uh, preaching and organising people. Yeah, I mean, uh, that was uh, an amazing part, I suppose, of his life. And, you know, it was held in the Argentine in 1934. 
and uh, the announcement, I suppose, of the Eucharistic Congress in Ireland would have been received, you know, with the average, I, I suppose, you know, not with, with, with great news or anything like that. But I suppose the fact that the previous Congress had been held in Dublin in, in 1932 would have um, <clears throat> had significance, you know, because um, with the fact that the Congress, uh, people would have been wondering who would have be traveling, I suppose, mm -hmm. to the Argentine um, for, for the next one, which following on from the Irish one. And um, Father Hayes was chosen. Uh, he was invited by the Palatine Fathers of the Argentine to give uh, missions, retreats, and lectures and uh, in preparation for the Congress. And um, I suppose he was really, if you like, far advanced of the Irish delegation in planning his journey because uh, he really had all his wits about him. He knew going out there, what he wanted to do. I mean, he wasn't looking at this as, as, a, as a holiday in any way. Mm. You know, he was looking at this as a very significant event and a role that he could play and uh, how this could be promoted in Ireland, you know. And he did that by, through the media, through the Irish media, mm -hmm. you know, through the likes of the Irish Independent and other newspapers and reaching out to them and in getting them to take articles about his travels mm -hmm. and you know his travels to Argentina to the Argentine might have gone fairly unnoticed I think mm -hmm. were it not for for those kind of articles yeah. that he was writing and sending home you know because they were very important in highlighting the whole his whole role out there and mm -hmm. what was happening and uh, it was really I suppose it was uh, a major event in his life uh, it was something I, I, I think that uh, that he referred to often mm -hmm. and um, his diary the diaries that he kept would have uh, would have indicated how significant it was in his thinking and in his role. Yeah, and his diary, as we talked about, is, you know, passion for history. His transatlantic diary often referred to, you know, the coffin ships and people making that transatlantic passage almost 100 years previously. But another aspect of it is he was very, very media savvy. And as you say, you know, the Irish Independent took travel, uh, you know, uh, travel articles from him. But he contacted the Southern Cross newspaper in Buenos Aires. And by the time he landed in Buenos Aires, he was already a familiar name. You know, uh, the, the Southern Cross, of course, is very connected with Ireland, with uh, uh, Eamon Bulfin, who was you know, the, one of the, the former editors of it. Uh, but it started with um, a priest from Tume in County Galway, established it in the 1870s. So he was quite media savvy and preparing the ground for himself for when he got over there. I think in terms of developing his skills as a public speaker, he was already a very, you know, well-polished public speaker, but delivering lectures to people in, in Argentina, I think developed that on. He did attempt to establish Munchen it here. I don't know if how serious it was taken there or how you know serious he pushed the issue given you know the lack of time that he was there but there he met up with uh, Bishop Patrick Lyons who, do, who would go on to become Bishop Patrick Lyons and he brought uh, Patrick Lyons into the Munchenitier fold so he, he came he came on board when they got back so in terms of that it was very significant for the development of Munchenitier when they got back to Ireland yeah, I think um, he was a very uh, influential figure in in Father Hayes's uh, life as well, um, because, as you say, he was uh, a man of paramount importance. Uh, that was Monsignor Lyons, 
later become Bishop of Kilmore. And uh, from the Muinter angle, the Monsignor had long, you know, had been a man that, that, uh, that Father Hayes wanted to bring on board. And uh, so I think that um, he, he was inveigled, if you like, into it. And uh, I think that there was, there was a whole, the, there was a whole thinking that Father Hayes was bringing to people and that was hugely, um, was hugely radical in ways, uh, but was also very forward, forward thinking. And, um, you know, the representative as, as he was in Buenos Aires at the time in the Argentine, he was seen as being the representative of the Cashel Archdiocese. And uh, he's, um, he's, his significance, I think, out there um, was huge. Uh, uh, you mentioned about the newspapers and he, he managed to do that, you know, within hours of landing there, he had a special interview to a representative of the standard. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he managed to, he had a great rapport with the media. Mm -hmm. And I suppose a lot of that was the fact that he had, that he, he was such a good orator and that he had very good one-liners as well. Mm -hmm. And he, he was able to capture headlines for the media, um, which, which many people wouldn't have been able to do at that time. But he was, and um, it, it, that's why I think that his whole, the, the, I mean, they the treated uh, Father Hayes, you know, uh, with, with such respect and reverence, I think, in, in the Argentine. You know, he had a huge impact on people. And when he spoke and when he delivered uh, lectures or anything, you know, I, I, I think when the man spoke at all, people were uh, captured by him. Yeah. And I know uh, uh, the historian Jeremy Ferder, who wrote the uh, short biography of Hayes in the Dictionary of Irish Biography, mentioned his oratory skills you know, whether it be in the Argentine or, you know, the, the, the Pioneers meeting in Croke Park in, in 1949. Yes. So, but when we come back to Ireland, mention it here is in a, a sort of transitional period before they come to 1937, they wind up the mention it here limited and embrace, you know, the vocationalist program. But I think hand in hand with that goes the expansion of the rural weeks. So we, we kind of see a, a, a new, you know, to use that uh, land league phrase, a new departure. Uh, I think he'd be, appreciate that. But it, from 1937 onwards, we see a different here, don't we? Yes, we do. We do. I think uh, the whole uh, thinking behind Winter uh, changed. Um, I suppose there was a new and broader outlook to the organisation. And uh, that was needed, uh, I think, uh, to encompass, I suppose, all classes of people. And because that's really what Father Hayes wanted. He wanted everybody involved, you know, and he didn't want, which was his great saying, he didn't want Tuppence looking down on, on mm -hmm. a halfpenny. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and uh, he, he, he wanted, uh, all classes of people involved. And he wanted to see uh, industry, he wanted to see people working, um, and he wanted to see a better life for people. And that's why, you know, the, the forming of Muintanatira in Tipperary, because um, that's where the first uh, branch of Winter was, was in Tipperary after he came there as a curate. And, um, you know, when, when he was given a public welcome, um, 
on his return from Argentina, Argentina, um, there was a huge concourse of people, you know, um, assembled to welcome him back at that time. And I think that, you know, that's kind of remarkable mm. that he had gone out to Argentina uh, to preach and uh, he was given such a huge public welcome that people turned out in their, in their thousands, several mm. thousands of people, you know, came as Father Hayes returned to Tipperary. And that was kind of, I think, a new dawn, if you like. Um, you know, all of those people coming together, it was the new dawn for Canon Hayes, I suppose it was the new mm. thinking. And then it led to him to founding uh, the new Muinter, as, yeah. as, uh, as we see it, the yeah. new organization, Muinter Natira, uh, in 1937 in Tipperary. And uh, I think that uh, that is a, a hugely significant time for the organization. It's also a hugely sig significant time for Canon Hayes mm -hmm. because he was looking at, um, he was looking at other ideas in relation to rural Ireland and particularly to rural industry, you know, and this was, this was where Muintantira played such a pivotal role and um, was that he uh, was responsible for bringing rural industry to Tipperary town mm -hmm. and to other places and um, where Tipperary leads Ireland follows is mm -hmm. a famous uh, <laughs> saying and I suppose that's where Father Hayes was thinking at the time and, you know, when he brought people together in Tipperary, I suppose he, he, he brought people like-minded, but people that he felt would, would work towards the ideals, yeah. you know, towards the ideals of development and this whole concept of Muintras. Yeah. And I think what separates it from the first incarnation of the of the movement is that, you know, they tailored their the projects to local needs. It wasn't a, a, a top down, you know, a blanket set of rules that people had to operate within. They were tailored to the different parishes, you know, the needs, maybe, you know, cleaning up graveyards, uh, like you say, rural industries they did diversify and I think that's what is particularly in the expansion period in the 1940s I think that's what was behind it that they suited local needs rather than you know a uniform set of uh, set way of working. Yeah I think that you see the different things that happened um, when Canon Hayes uh, was in Tipperary when he had come to Tipperary and the different things that happened. You know, if you look even like at the likes of what he set up for the allotments, you know, mm -hmm, the allotments yep. scheme. And then there was the Lino factory and the glove factory and, you know, the opening of those particular industries. And uh, this was all, he, he envisaged that this was a starting point that other places that could be replicated in other parishes around the country. Mm -hmm. So that it was important for him to ensure that, uh, that communities were established, that people were brought to, together in a kind of a, a council mm -hmm. or a cooperative, in a cooperative way. And this was where the whole thing of the, the community council evolved from you know, was in bringing people together uh, to ensure that they could do the same thing in their parish. Yeah. Uh, that what, what he had been able to do in Tipperary uh, before, before Winter was founded, uh, you know, as it was in 1937, that, uh, that this could be done in other parishes and that he could see that um, 
by bringing people together that there was never ending possibilities. And um, it was all about uh, ensuring that everybody came together, that there was no distinction, that there was no class distinction. And that, you know, that was why this community council uh, that thinking and the setting up of community councils all over the country. And it was kind of remarkable in a way that this happened. But in another way, it wasn't because rural Ireland was crying out at that time for somebody to lead them and for somebody to show them the way and to show that it was possible to uh, build this uh, parish hall and to build this facility, to build this school, to have group water schemes and uh, subsequently, of course, to have rural elect electrification. Mm -hmm. And Canon Hayes was the man to do that. Yeah. And, um, you know, traveling all over the country at all hours of the day and night um, in order to spread his message and to encourage people uh, to do what could be done in the, in the neighboring parish. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was a lot of it, you know, giving examples of this has been done in this parish. You can do this here in, you, in your parish. Mm -hmm. And it had a domino effect, you know, it, it, it just was like the ripple, you know, dropping the pebble into the ripple, the ripple grew yeah. wider and wider. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that that was really uh, what, what he did. Yeah. And it was remarkable mm -hmm. that it was done and that parishes all over the country uh, mobilized themselves. And of course, Father Hayes was in demand to come to every parish, yeah. uh, you know, whether it was to speak or whether it was to open a facility or whether it was to encourage people. And he tried to do that. Mm -hmm. And so Sinus was that eventually you know, the man's health gave way really was because he was doing this. Yeah. So I, I want to talk about, you know, later on in his career, but th that th what you've just brought up there, Martin, is very significant. You know, he was everywhere within Ireland. He was outside of Ireland as well, all acting on behalf of the organization. And he, he's made a canon in Bantia, where your parish Mark Tierney, in his book that we mentioned before, says that the church authorities and his superiors made a mistake in giving him uh, Bansha as a canon. They should have relieved him of his parish duties and let him focus on the organization. And perhaps that would have, you know, extended his life because, you know, leader of an organization and figurehead is a full time job as well, but as, as well as his, you know, uh, duties to his parishioners. He uh, was doing two full-time jobs at once. So do, what do you think about that? Do you think they should have just let him focus on the organization? Uh, I don't, because I don't think that um, he would have wished for that, because Canon Hayes, I, I think if that happened, it might have removed him from the people to a degree. And when I say that, I mean that he was very much a parish man. You know, he, he was the man that could call into a house for a cup of tea or, you know, a chat or whatever, a game of cards. And I, I think if he was given that role, it would have removed him from that aspect. Uh, because particularly in Bansha, I know that from my own history, that... Um, he he was really entwined in the parish and in the lives of the people. And that's what kept him going. You know, that's where he got his ideas, was in the parish, meeting the people and talking to the people. And even if it was uh, what was seen as maybe mundane conversations, you know, his mind was active all the time. So uh, he was constantly thinking. So it could be the small thing that would trigger something in him. And uh, I think that he loved 
the parish. Mm -hmm. The parish was what he lived for. And I think that was very evident in Bansha, where, you know, there was a stream of people nationally and internationally yeah. to his door. And it didn't make any difference for Father Hayes, whether it was a traveling man that came to his house. You know, Father Hayes would bring him in mm -hmm. and would uh, often give him his own meal. Mm -hmm. And this was something that wasn't probably very well known, but that happened, you know. Yeah. Father Hayes' meal might be prepared and a uh, traveling man had come to the door and Father Hayes would bring him in and give him his own meal mm -hmm. and engage with him. And this was the type of man that he was. So I think if you took that away from Canon Hayes, you would have taken a hugely important part of his life. Yeah. And uh, I'm saying this is a bancho man, but mm -hmm. it's quite evident that Father Hayes loved Bancho, that he loved his time in Bancho. And it was uh, there, I suppose, where he really grew and developed was when he was in Bancho, because it was there that he was able to roll out a lot of the initiatives that he was able to campaign for. You know, the likes of the, I mentioned the group water schemes and, you know, the parish plan for agriculture mm -hmm. and the rural electrification, mm -hmm. which I suppose was one of the most significant things that, that has happened um, in rural Ireland. And it can never, we can never, I suppose, speak about rural electrification without speaking about Canon Hayes, because it was he drove the whole concept of rural electrification. It was he went to parishes and encouraged people to take up rural electrification, where in parishes there was a lot of scepticism, there was a lot of worry and concern that this was going to cause great uh, trouble. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe that, you know, that some people saw that rural electrification was in some way the devil's work, if you like. Right. Uh, they didn't see this as as uh, bringing the light, uh, mm -hmm. which Canon Hayes saw it. You know, he yeah. saw it as bringing the light to people. You know, both the light of the electric light bulb and the light into people's houses and homes. And uh, he saw it completely different. So he campaigned vigorously for rural electrification, and the success of the rollout of it is down to Canon Hayes. You know, I know the ESB has to do the work, obviously, but the success of it was down to Canon Hayes. Yeah, and, you know, I suppose we could talk for hours and hours about the impact of the rural weeks that we mentioned that began as rural weekends. But all these ideas around rural electrification, the parish plan for agriculture, all had their, you know, um, genesis in these rural weeks. And there's one example, you talked about international guests coming to Bansha. They all came to Rural Weeks, no matter where it was, whether it was in Galway, whether it was in Tipperary, you know, or Waterford or wherever they took place. But you had international guests from right across the world. People who were like Arthur E. Morgan, who was a Quaker from uh, Tennessee, or no, he worked in the Tennessee Valley Authority bringing electrification to rural America in the 1930s. He came to Rural Week. So you have to imagine that rural electrification was a topic for discussion when he came along. But this international imprint that mentioned here began to have towards the end of the 1940s. It really took off in the last number of years of his life where he went to America, campaigned uh, right throughout America, met Arthur E. Morgan again, but significantly met the rural, um, the rural clergy member, Monsignor Luigi Liguri of the National Catholic Rural Life Conference, who in a way took Hayes under his wing and brought him into international networks of rural activists. Yes, that's uh, very true. And, you know, when you talk about Canon Hayes and his time in different countries. I mean, uh, Cardinal Cushing as well, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, he was very significant, uh, had a very significant influence there. And uh, he's, 
his, um, I, I suppose, you know, the fact that he could relate to, to everybody, to, to King and to Pauper, you know, it made no difference. And I mean, you know, we haven't even mentioned about his, uh, his encounter with Mussolini even, mm -hmm. you know, and there are so many different aspects to Canon Hayes's life. And uh, over my shoulder there is uh, something that was given to me by the Hayes family when, when I was national president. And it is the original symbol of Muinton Atira, and, uh, which is the, the cross and the plough. And uh, it was something, uh, I suppose, that the land uh, was very significant to, to Canon Hayes. And that was, I suppose, from coming from a farming family and everything, but the land was hugely significant. And he saw the, the protection of the land was also uh, very significant to him. And I think that all of those people that you mentioned there that he encountered and that came to, to rural weeks and came to Bench and, and uh, um, uh, sat with him and discussed various aspects of life um, it, it was amazing, really, that, that uh, a simple man, as he was a simple man, could have such significance and could play such a huge part um, in, in the development of Ireland. Mm -hmm. And this should not be ever forgotten, I think, is the development of rural Ireland and how it developed under Canon Hayes's remit because it was him, uh, it was Canon Hayes, I suppose, and his influence, I think, uh, with government and his, his uh, stubbornness, his doggedness, I suppose, as well, in going to um, uh, places, in going to government and refusing to come away from government without, uh, you know, something being delivered. I mean, that was the case in the Lino factory in Tipperary. The Lino factory was earmarked for, I think it was Navin, but um, Canon Hayes was determined to bring the Lino factory to Tipperary. And I think he refused to leave government building <laughs> without, before getting a, a, a commitment to it. And uh, that was the kind of man he was. And I mean, even in Bancha, you know, the, the, the jam factory as it was known, that was a major uh, achievement, you know, to have uh, in excess of 40 people there, up in 40, 50 people employed in a jam factory. And a lot of people like would have criticized him. Uh, well, at least some people, I won't say a lot of people, some people would have criticized him then when the jam factory failed. But of course, you know, a lot of industries failed. And uh, it was the fact that it survived for so long and that, you know, it brought life to a rural village. And, uh, you know, you could mention all the successes. You would have to mention all the successes, all the different things that he brought and developed uh, rather, than, rather than the failure. And I think, you know, Canon Hayes would be forced to admit that, you know, uh, he also failed in different aspects of his life. Uh, and he would have said that. Yeah. And he would have hoped that things could have been done differently. And uh, I, I think that was uh, significant about him. And one of the things I think that was also significant was, you know, while he could be st stubborn uh, by all accounts, he, he would always say sorry. And I think Tom Fitzgerald, who worked with him all his life, yeah. Uh, would say that that was something that was very much a case with Canon Hayes. He would be first to say sorry afterwards, yeah. you know, if he had upset him or had done something. And uh, I think that that says a multitude about the man and uh, the kind of person that he was. I, I know that in my own home, uh, and there's a photograph there to, behind me as well of Canon Hayes, but there's one that we have of uh, Canon Hayes because he would have performed the marriage ceremony of my mom and dad. And uh, it's a, a 
a photograph that we we treasure. Uh, he was joined celebrant of the mass because uh, my mum was from Dunohill. And uh, he, um, I think that, you know, the many people that, Going back to what I was saying earlier about Ken Hayes and the man in the parish, you know, he tried to do as many things as he could. He tried to be at the marriages, to celebrate the marriages, uh, to celebrate the births, to do the funerals and do all the other things. Um, so that's why it was a parish man. And parish life was hugely significant to him. Martin, you've made a very good point there of, you know, his concern with the land, concern with the people of the land. Of course, that's the, you know, the, the name of the organisation. But my understanding is, of it is that as Munchnitir grew and we look at all, you know, people from around the world coming through Bansha to look at that, he developed a concern for people, rural people throughout the world. And I think, you know, when you get up into the 1950s, He's in Rome, he's in Barcelona at all these different congresses dedicated to rural people. But he dies at a relatively young age of 69 on the 30th of January, 1957. How big of a hole did that leave in Munchenitira? Well, I think that um, his death um, was, uh, I suppose, it it was devastating really for the organization and for the people. It really was devastating uh, because people felt that they had lost uh, a friend. It wasn't just that they had lost the leader of the organization. Everybody felt, I think, that they had lost a, a close personal friend because regardless of whether they were in, in Bansha or in Ireland or across the world, you know, people regarded Canon Hayes as their friend. Even people that met him maybe on just the one occasion, they came away feeling that they had met a friend and that they had a friend for life and that they had somebody that they could call on. And that's why his funeral probably, I, I, I would put it down as being one of the most significant funerals in the history of Ireland, because um, never before, I think, would you have seen uh, the Taoiseach and all members of the government bow one um, in attendance and members of the Dáil and Shannon and representatives of public organisations and the leader of the opposition, mm -hmm. along with the Taoiseach, uh, who was uh, John A. Costello, the leader of the opposition at the time, and Eamon de Valera, uh, present. And uh, Bansha Church was full with dignitaries mm -hmm. because there was no room for the ordinary person. Uh, but the ordinary people didn't mind that because they realized that you know, uh, Canon Hayes was such a significant figure in uh, the lives of church and state that he deserved the recognition of the church being devoted to dignitaries and the ordinary people standing in the porches and around the, the walls of the church and, and the graveyard and uh, being there as one big family, if you like, it didn't matter that they couldn't get into the church. The fact that they were there was this one big family that Canon Hayes had spoken about. And um, I think that the fact that he died relatively quickly and though his health was declining for a little bit, he died relatively quickly. I think that that would have had uh, a huge it left a huge hole in the organization as uh, to who was going to replace him mm -hmm. and to how the organization was going to continue. And a lot of people would have considered that was the end, mm -hmm. you know, that that would be the end of Winton Atira. But I suppose it is to his legacy and it is to 
uh, what he had built up, that the organization continued and indeed flourished over the years. And uh, that, uh, that is, I think, a testament to his legacy that the organization has continued so strongly. And what he left behind him stood the test of time and the people as well that he had surrounded himself with that were strong enough to keep the organization going. Uh, because I think that, as I said, you know, many people would have um, spoken on the day and in days following his death that will this be the end of Muinton Atira? And, um, you know, it is a great tribute, I suppose. It is a lasting tribute to him that the organization was able to continue and to continue so strongly. And to, I suppose, I, I think that there are an awful lot of things that you can point to uh, since his death, which had his stamp, if you like, mm -hmm. on, on. And uh, I think that he would be very pleased with uh, many of the initiatives that have been roll, rolled out um, for in-community development uh, since, since his time as uh, president. And, you know, it's amazing, I suppose, he became president of Winton Atira. Um, a lot of people say that it was a self-appointed role um, when he was in Casalini, you know, in the original organization. Uh, that he became president of Internet Era, but I think uh, it has been very important that that role has continued uh, national president and that it is seen as a very significant and important role and that Internet Era is under the patronage of the president of Ireland. I think that all of those things are very significant and are a lasting testament to Father Hayes. Martin, uh, I think we could probably go on and talk about the post Hayes eras because there's a lot going on in there too. But I think given that the significance of the date, we'll, we'll just focus on uh, Canon Hayes himself. But before we go, I'd just like to congratulate you on your, your recent book. Uh, uh, could you tell people who are, who are looking in and listening in what it is and, and where they can find it? Yes, uh, I suppose uh, it is. Uh, it was an initiative that I did during lockdown. And you know, when the first lockdown hit us uh, in March of uh, 2020, um, like everybody else, I, I mean, I just didn't know what to do with myself initially. You know, I was, uh, I was in a conflux as they say. Uh, I didn't know whether I was coming or going for a period of time like everybody else. What was I going to do with my time and uh, though I was very busy in a number of different organizations and I knew that there'd be still the likes of what I'm doing today, the Zoom meetings and all of that, I, I knew that it was going to create a huge gap and uh, I didn't particularly know what I wanted to do. But uh, one of the things that I did kind of religiously was I went for a walk every day within, within the, the, the restrictions. And it put me thinking about uh, people, including Canon Hayes. It put me thinking of people from my area who had uh, achieved notoriety uh, on the national and international stage, I suppose. I was really thinking nationally at the time. And um, I, I thought of uh, people like Canon Hayes who came directly straight to mind. And I thought of maybe people that have played a role in the War of Independence and others like that. So it put me thinking that it would be nice to document them, to give uh, an account of people um, from the area and uh, just a kind of synopsis of their life, if you like, a brief synopsis of them and uh, a little bit of history about them so that people would know a little bit more and where they came from. And uh, I started out, I suppose, thinking that I would have maybe a couple of dozen people. And I ended up with 86 people <laughs> from 
the Tipperary town and district. And these were people, uh, I discovered a lot of people from the, from the arts and from the political and uh, from the judiciary and from sporting. So there was people across different things. And I even included, you know, a couple of people. I included somebody that had survived the Titanic. And I included a man that had been pardoned posthumously by, by the president. Yes. And uh, all people from the, the area and people who had traveled abroad and had achieved and that we knew nothing, very little about. And, uh, you know, one man who, who comes to mind, who left the parish of Denohill, and, and Denohill would be well known because it's where Dan Breen is from. Mm -hmm. But this man left the parish of Denohill and went out to Ohio and founded uh, banking, uh, founded a banking uh, organization called Fahi Banking. And it is still trading and doing, it's very strong. And uh, his descendants, uh, are, are still operating the bank. You know, so I came across people like that and I put together a book and I called it Tipperary People of Great Note. And I asked uh, Dr. Martin Manzer, mm -hmm. the former government minister and historian, if he would write a foreword to it. And he gladly said he would. And I'd come across a painting of his, of his late mother's on a card that he had sent to me at one stage of the Galtys and the Glen of Aherlow. And I thought it was a beautiful painting and I contacted him and said, any chance could I use that painting for the cover of the book? And he said, you surely can, but I have to ask my daughter because she has the rights to the painting. And uh, Fiona agreed readily uh, to using it. So I used that as the, as the cover to the book and uh, Dr. Manza did the foreword. And of course it was appropriate because he's, his father, Nicholas, is in the book as well. Uh, he's one of the 86 people. So uh, it was published by Arpen Press mm -hmm. and um, it was really, uh, it has been a huge achievement for me to do it. Um, it's, it's a brief, as I say, synopsis of the 86 people, but it gives a flavor of their life and times of where they went to and where they came from and where they went to. And uh, some very interesting people and stories. And I've been able to do some stories about the people as a result that have been published in the likes of the Ireland's own and on websites like Irish Central and uh, other websites as well. So it has uh, certainly given me, given me great, uh, it gave me a lot of food for thought in the first place and uh, it gave me something to do during lockdown. Martin, thanks a million for joining me today. It's a real honour because, you know, as I say, I've been researching uh, the organisation for a number of years now. And it's just uh, an honour to speak to a former president and someone who knows the organisation and its history well. So thank you very much. Yes, and I suppose to finish up, I should say, you know, Canon Hayes is, uh, is dearly remembered in, in Bancha, of course, where he's buried. And he, uh, for anybody that wants to come to Bancha, he's buried just behind the church, at the rear of the church. It was his wish to be buried there. And he said... Uh, uh, before he died, that if they had the money, <laughs> that they could put up a statue to our Blessed Lady, because he has a great devotion to Our Lady, that they could put up a statue to Our Blessed Lady at his head, and that has been done. And uh, everybody, of course, is always welcome to come to Bansha. Um, and, you know, if there are people around, they'll tell you a bit about the history of the different initiatives that were rolled out in Bansha and to visit his grave directly behind the church in Bansha Cemetery. Thanks very much, Martin. Thank you, Barry.